part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Hey, this is Chase Smith, founder and CEO of Press Play Podcast. You may have heard me on the Orange is Orange or Cleveland Browns podcast with Jeremy Powell, now wonderfully hosted by Holly Wetzel, Cavs on the Break NBA podcast with Sam Amico, or my own podcast, the Chase Smith Podcast. I wanted to take a few moments to talk to you about a brand new subscription-based podcast we're offering this football season, the Press Play Sports Podcast. This premium podcast feed will send all of the sports podcasts offered on the Press Play Podcast Network to one central feed. Yes, you can still follow and subscribe to all of our individual shows for free on every podcast platform. But if you wanted to consolidate your podcast feed and listen to them all in one location, the Press Play Sports Podcast is for you. I'm talking the Oranges and Orange Browns podcast with Holly Wetzel and Jeremy Powell, Red Guy and Rhoda, Sable Brothers on the Baseline, Cavs on the Break, the Dennis Maniloff Show, the Ball Card Show, the Premium Fantasy Podcast, a Swing and a Tribe MLB Podcast, and the Tim and Shipe Show, a college football podcast, all in one feed. All nine of our sports shows curated into one single podcast feed. Out the door, you're looking at five thirty six a month after tax. That's five dollars and thirty six cents, just about the cost of a drink at Starbucks. And this is only offered on Apple Podcasts. You can't get this anywhere else. It's an Apple Podcast exclusive. Just go to the search bar and search Press Play Sports. It'll come up and you can subscribe from there. We're excited to offer this consolidated, curated sports feed for you to enjoy. And as always, thank you so much for listening and your support. I can't believe it. We've made it to episode 10. We did. And and I guess by now, episode 10, the fact that we're rolling ads at the front end of the podcast means we're getting popular enough that the network thinks you're going to stick around and listen to us. Yeah. How about that? How about it? We're back after a little hiatus. Yeah, we missed a couple of weeks there because somebody decided to take their happy ass to uh, Vegas and spend a few days out there. I robbed that place. That's not how I recall your text messages at <laughs> one in the morning coming across. Well, I could have robbed that place. <laughs> I just did, it didn't if feel. If you had right. enough money left to go, COVID's buy a gun. already been so hard on Vegas. I didn't <laughs> want to leave them in financial ruin. <laughs> that's, was, that's how you're going to play that. Oh, Caesar was going to be pissed if I won any more money. I get a phone call that says these casinos decided lock these slots down. They got to make their money back after COVID. <laughs> that's exactly what happened. <laughs> Tightest slots in the world right now are in Las Vegas. Oh, so Jason just at one a.m. Don't be dramatic. It was like ten o'clock my time. Well, yeah, 1 a.m. here. I was crying into a pizza in the hotel room. Yeah, I mean, I understand. I've, I've been there. I've played that game. It was just funny to watch somebody else do it. Uh, yeah, so Jason's wife is kind of a big deal in her field. And so she got a trip to Vegas. And for some reason, she took this schlub along with her. Yeah, and a little arm he candy. literally just all day gambled not, and drank not beer. all day. I took and naps. And ate food took naps i went sightseeing <laughs> to other casinos <laughs> right yeah i went up to fremont street to see the golden nugget it's a real crap hole isn't it it's you know what it's like the chipotle of fast foods you think i do because there are some others out there like circus circus oh yeah but you're not so you get into like circus circus realms that's legitimately like the walmart of vegas loose slots at circus circus Loose everything at Circus Circus. Loose wallpaper on the lobby when right. I walked in. <laughs> yeah, everything at Circus Circus is just not quite up to but, snuff. But, you know, I wasn't ready for the heat. It, lo- it felt like I was checking on a pizza in my oven <laughs> anywhere <laughs> I walked time. nonstop. <laughs> it was radial heat off of the concrete and everything else. Plus, you have a mask on the whole you time. You meant radiant around. heat, right? No, radial. Like it was a, circular? Yeah, it was, heat cir- was circular. it was circulating around me. <laughs> Don't you use your big words with me, sir? <laughs> I didn't use a big word. You tried you to use a big word. You blue-collar technician. You failed How oh, dare horribly. you? You grease monkey turning I, wrenches. I'm a college-educated grease monkey just like you are. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> anyway, back from Vegas, back from a big trip, and boy, do we have a lot to talk about. There is a lot to talk about. Um, I know that the last couple of months in this hobby have felt a little bit like a whirlwind. And more and more keeps happening. And I think we're still just starting to see the the wave of the changes that are coming crest. Uh, the industry summit. I'm sorry. They're coming crest? The wave that is coming. The wave is just starting to crest. The wave is cresting? Not quite. It's working on it. It's coming crest. Yeah. Okay. 
This guy. I just needed to know what <laughs> This guy. Okay. Anyhow. Sometimes ind- your small words don't make sense. <laughs> Industry Summit this week. Uh, there's a lot going on. Uh, I did not get to go, but talked to quite a few people who did. The big takeaways, just kind of an overview. The vast majority of talk at the Industry Summit was around social media and its impact on the hobby, as well as what you would expect the talk to be about, which was the fanatics takeover of this industry. One of the things that I heard multiple people tell me when I talked to them about the Industry Summit was that the talk about social media got to the point of ad nauseum. And for several of the shop owners that I know who were there, they made the point over and over again that a large portion of their clientele doesn't utilize social media, doesn't want to utilize social media, and doesn't care about the chatter around the hobby. And yeah. while long time collectors, yeah, a lot and, of long-time and collectors. while we may think of that and look at that and go, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. If you ignore that, you're ignoring it at your own peril and at your pocketbooks peril. Uh, there are people out there that just don't care about all these things that we talk about all the time. They just want to buy the things that they like. Um, they still use Beckett for pricing. And if you're selling, that's a positive. If you're buying, it's a horrible idea. And they carry their cell phone with a strap around their shoulder. They, or in a fanny pack. In a fanny right? pack. Um, this is a car phone. I had a conversation with somebody about Beckett pricing the other day, and uh, they posted a picture of a spreadsheet that they made. They opened an absolute baseball blaster. Mm. So they took $30 and flushed it down the toilet, mm-hmm. but they had fun doing it. But they, they absolutely made, did. Yeah, they, <laughs> they made, they made, <laughs> you, I teed that up. Didn't know I teed yeah. it up and you were so ready for it. So happy. Uh, they made a spreadsheet of every card in the blaster, right? And a court, and they used their Beckett collector's yes. guide to do this. How else would you? According you know? to Beckett, the value of the cards in that $30 blaster mm-hmm. was roughly $4 million. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but it was legitimately like $60. There wasn't a card in that blaster valued under a dollar, which is laughable. Well, valuable to list, but harder to sell. And by harder to sell, you mean we'll never sell. Nobody's going to buy a- unlicensed uh, base cards for a dollar a piece. Yeah, no, it's not going to happen. On. I told the guy when he was telling me about it. I said, um, if if that's your stance, like that's where you price things, that's cool. I would like to sell you my entire collection. Um, my entire collection is probably oh. worth around twenty k in real dollars, but Beckett dollars, I'm a millionaire. Yeah. Let's let's make this happen. I'll give you a heck of a deal. I'll sell you my collection for half a million dollars. I'll do half of Beckett's pricing. And still come out ahead of comps. Yeah. I like yeah. it. Yeah. So So that was the that was the talk on that part of it. The other big talk was with Fanatics. There's been a lot of speculation a leading lot of up questions. to these. Yeah. I didn't understand but what's gonna happen. How is Fanatics gonna make cards? Are they a lot of the talk was, well, they're gonna buy Panini. Panini's been trying to be sold anyway. They're they're gonna buy Panini. Tops is gonna die if they don't buy them. Well, the consensus coming out of the industry summit is Fanatics isn't buying anybody. They're going to build their own business from the ground up with exclusive licenses with the three major sports in America, and they want to build their own thing and dominate, which means that Panini and Topps, and, well, Upper Deck to an extent, but Upper Deck does hockey and good ones and good ones, which nobody really cares about. Hockey collectors collect hockey. Hockey collectors are some of the most passionate collectors you're ever going to meet. There's just not a lot of them. Uh, But the the consensus is that Fanatics is going to build their own thing from the ground up, and that means that Topps and Panini are going to have to focus on the things that they have left, which is for Topps, soccer, and F1, for Panini, soccer, um, underwater and, basket weaving. Yeah, and just a few other just random non-sports things like Panini makes Fortnite cards and things like that. Which some of those early ones are. Oh yeah, some of the early Fortnite stuff goes for stupid money. It's shocking if you look up comps. You might be listening to this going, "These guys are idiots." I'm telling you right now, get on eBay and look up sold comps for cracked ice Fortnite cards like from Series, series One and one, Series yeah. Two, yeah. Season One, Series whatever. Yeah, you call it. It, it's stupid, stupid dollars. Yeah, nerd alert, right? Yeah. Uh, 
So they're going to focus on those things. And then Fanatics is going to build their own thing from the ground up. The other big concern with Fanatics taking over, because Fanatics has such a uh, robust and well-developed online delivery platform, direct-to-consumer platform, is that they were going to, car shops were just going to die. They weren't going to be able to get anything. Mm, yeah. The consensus coming out of the industry summit was that's not going to be the case completely. There will be some contraction. Uh, there will be a, a kind of like what Panini did when they first started out. You had to have meet certain requirements to be direct with Panini. Mm -hmm. So if you're an LCS that has an actual storefront and it's clean and you can show sales and you can show that you provide good customer service, you're still going to have an opportunity to buy things at wholesale prices. Mm -hmm. uh, distributors uh, are going to still distribute panini and tops and upper deck products but at the end of the day the real winner in the distribution side of things might be a company like leaf uh, who these distributors haven't really touched in large quantities because they had other things to sell well now they're not going to have as many things to right. sell and leaf doesn't really have to change what they do they're yeah. already all non-licensed you know direct um, relationships with players. Tons uh, of hits. Yeah, and, and so there, I think that Leaf might come out of this thing as a winner, but breakers, the large breakers, uh, are also going to be fine. I think they're going to be able to establish relationships directly with Fanatics. That's the the talk. I, I was going to jump in on no, that. Jump. I think it'll be a little bit of a challenge for them to get I don't know why Fanatics would try to create a different scenario than what Panini directly had or Topps directly had or some of these other um, companies. I think they love the squeeze on being able to set those premiums. They they bought a monopoly. You know, they essentially Fanatics is going to run the monopoly on major sports that are licensed. And I think these breakers who have been really pretentious and – unwilling to break some of these products like leaf or unlicensed stuff because they only do the best and blah, blah, blah. You're going to find them breaking a lot of unlicensed stuff. Oh, I think that, I think you're right on that front. Um, I think that the one thing that fanatics is going to do, and I've said this since this news broke, they are getting into this market for two reasons. One it's a massive market that still has tons of growth potential. But I think just looking at how Fanatics has built their other business lines, that they also understand that if they don't do something to introduce product at a price point that makes sense for the average person, that eventually the hobby is going to cannibalize itself. And they wouldn't be sinking the dollars into sure. this on the front end if they didn't see a play that's 20 years long. Do you think we see more of a push with Tops, Panini, some of these others in that NFT space? Um, It'll be unlicensed NFT stuff. And, and so we talked about player image and likeness yeah. um, and this change with Fanatic. So Panini wouldn't even have the ability to, to have a product with the likeness of a player? Correct. So just like tops had unless this it's a college player. Okay. Yeah, which does open up a whole new market. Yeah, and I think because that essentially we about you're that selling before. draft picks at that point. Well, yeah, but you're selling guys that are currently mm -hmm. in college. Mm -hmm. You know, so we talked about Quinn Ewers a few weeks ago, Ohio State's uh, new freshman uh, that's sitting the bench right now. Uh, there's a lot of people at Ohio State that are erroneously screaming for him to play, but it's a bad idea. Not yet. Um, but that kid is going to have cards long before he's in the NFL. Um, and I think that there will be – Panini already has relationships with the NCAA and the major conferences for use of their logos. So then it just becomes a question of how to structure contracts so that players that are existing in college get paid for the use of their name and yeah. likeness. Uh, and so I think you will start to see pre-rookie cards – much like Bowman firsts yeah. uh, are uh, for college football players. And I think you'll see it in college basketball as well. And I think that Panini and Tops will also be trying to, if if they're smart about it, they're going to make it feel like when you are, when you are joining a power conference, power five conference, and you have 
you know, a, a stud coming in like this quarterback that this is essentially their debut as a professional athlete because they're being paid from this point on. Like almost trying to shift the optics on that, which we're laughing now, but some of these contracts that are coming out, you know, the, you were just talking about um, yours coming in. What was his contract for? $1.2 million. For how many years? One, I believe. One year, $1.2 million just on exclusive autographs and, yep. you know, product. So what's going to happen in year two? Or if somebody's being paid 2 or $3 million a year in appearances, autographs, all this kind of stuff, but they're going to be a higher draft stock if they wait two more years. And so for the next couple of years, we just need you to be okay with $6 million. Like, you're going to see people staying a little bit longer before making the leap. Oh, I think for sure that's the case. And I think where it will really come into play is in the NCAA basketball world. Uh, right now, if you are a top top end talent coming out of high school a top 20 guy in the country you aren't going to college to go to college right at all right. you're going to just stay eligible through your first semester and most of those guys don't even go to a class a second semester because as long as they got d's mm -hmm. they're good and they can play the rest of the season and then they're out anyway mm -hmm. so i think you're right i think that um especially for guys that are kind of on that bubble. Am I a borderline first-round pick? Am I a borderline lottery pick? Well, now I don't have to try to set myself up for life with that contract. Mm -hmm. I can make a couple million dollars here yeah. and stay. I think that's a very, very valid point which that I hadn't really thought of. Yeah, which gives these you know, Panini Tops and whoever a little more time with these talented players to make them a celebrity to drive up their market, to spend some money on developing their brand. Like th sure. there's going to be, you know, in, re in relation to cards, obviously they're not the agents right. or the agency. But um, I think that, that that's an angle I would aggressively be approaching of how do we, how do we get into that before fanatics tries to buy up college licenses? Right. Well, and one of the, one of the things I think that is also something that you have to think about with that one thing that if you've been around this hobby for a while and you've interacted with other people in this hobby, and I'm not talking about you've got a buddy, but I mean, if you're buying and selling on Facebook, if you're buying and selling on eBay, if you're interacting in groups and you're interacting with trade nights and card shows, there's one almost shockingly consistent thread that runs through this hobby and the people in it. We tend to be regressive and we tend to be unbelievably stubborn. If you've decided that PSA is where it's at, everybody else is crap. If you're not PSA, you're crap. That's a stance that a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. and I see it with other things too. If it's, if it's a baseball card and it's not Topps Chrome, it's crap. Um, it's a very difficult audience a very difficult uh group of people to convince that they need to change their mind about something and part of that is this is a little bit of a heady nerdy space it is so there's a lot of research and knowledge you right. need to have to be adequate in it like yeah. you and i both have friends that have listened to the podcast they're like i like a lot of this but three episodes in i still am just scratching the surface yeah i don't know what's going on hobby yeah where you and i as soon as we got into this or especially in the last few years as it's picked back up it's like we're just consuming as much information about this yeah. as we can because, honestly, when you're looking at an investment side or getting into breaks or collecting or selling, whatever, doing your research on this is significant. So because of that, I think people are so fixated on quick returns that it's creating some of that problem you have. Like everybody has preferences, favorite products, products sure. they hate. I get it. But I think part of it is this like day trading mentality yeah. with card collecting, and it's – Card well, and, trading more than it is collecting, oh, for honestly. Sure. And, and one of the things that's important to think about in that, and this is why when I see and talk to people that think that way, that think that regressively, Warren Buffett oh. says it best. When people are not afraid, you should be afraid. And when people are afraid, you shouldn't be afraid. Uh, grading, it's, it's a great kind of segue into something we hadn't really talked about talking about, but I want to bring it up. Because I want our audience to get some value when we have these discussions. So when we talk about grading, one of the things that a lot of people don't know or they haven't put the dots together with, and I'm going to share it with you now, Fanatics within five years will be making every single licensed trading card for all three major sports. 
That's just the way that it is. It's not going to change. That's where we're at. The owner of Fanatics is also the majority shareholder for the in the Blackstone Boys. Group. Oh. The Blackstone Group bought CSG. Mm -hmm. If we think, and I think you're an idiot if you don't think this, that Fanatics is going to make products that include slabbed cards, just like Panini and Topps do now. If you think that any of those cards will be in anything other than a CSG slab, you're out of your damn mind. You are out of your mind. That's a really good. That's a really good point. So within five years, every single major high-end rookie card that comes out of a box that's in a slab will be in a CSG slab. They really need to redesign that <laughs> label. So here's the thing, though. <laughs> I, I will say this: I'm not a fan of the label. It's ugly. It looks way better in person than it's it does still in pictures. So bad. It looks horrible without subgrades. With subgrades, it's not awful. It's not good. But that being said. I'm telling you, that's coming. If you are a long-term investor, buying up CSG slabs that are 9s and 9.5s and 10s now is a no-brainer, in mm -hmm. my opinion. And keep in mind, CSG grades tougher than just about anybody. And a lot of people don't realize the two guys that run the grading department at CSG for sports cards were the top two guys at BSG and CSG stole yeah. them away. So we're not talking about some fly-by-night stuff here. G uh, CSG, they're giving out 10s at a slightly slower rate than BGS does. And BGS is known to be the toughest 10 to get in the industry. CSG is tougher. Yeah, um, but talk about for a minute... The perception still that's yeah. dominant. Like, obviously, that's going to shift. So you had the Luca 10, right, yeah. that came back. And from what you, research that you've done, that's a harder 10 than... Than BGS. Yeah. Yeah. So, but not harder than a pristine? It's not harder than a black label. Right. But their, but CSG's version of a black label, which is four 10s, is just as tough, if not tougher, than a BGS. Yeah. Mine was three 10s and a 9.5. So you had some really good dialogue on a, one or two groups. I remember yeah. reading through a thread... And there were idiots in there, but there are also some people that are just kind of talking through it. What seems to be the response to something like that at the, this point? The response right now is a relative consensus that it is a tougher 10, but that the current market value doesn't support the price point that it probably should. Um, I've told multiple people that have asked me about that particular card because it is a pop one, pop one. There isn't yeah. even a BGS 10 of that card. Um, it's a rookie? Yeah, it's a Luca rookie. Status is a really difficult set to grade. Mm -hmm. It is a foil card with full bleed all the way to the edges, so any corner wear shows up immediately. Um, it's, it's a tough set to grade. In my opinion, if I was going to sell that card right now, uh, PSA 10s comp around 250. There's only been one uh, BGS 10. There's no black labels. One BGS 10 sale of that card was at 750. I would probably want to be around 450 to 500 dollars if I was going to yeah. sell that card right now. I don't expect it to have the, currently the market value of a BGS 10 because CSG doesn't have the market sway. Or definitely that perceived value. But it's value not being sold point. for 180 dollars, right, right, which right. is what some idiots were offering me for yeah. it. Um, you sure you don't want to take 180 on it? 100 percent. Okay. Um, so I, I think that there's a huge opportunity if you are a long-term buyer on some things right now to buy some CSG stuff, especially if you can find numbered stuff, you know, higher end stuff, you can get it pretty cheap. And I will be absolutely stunned if every Fanatics graded typeset, like encased, mm -hmm. um, isn't in a CSG slab. Nice. Be interesting. I think it'll shift a lot of that's going on right now. Oh, I, I think it will. And this is what people don't understand. I mean, so much of the hobby, especially what you see in groups and on Instagram, are people. I would I would say conservatively, seventy percent of the people in these groups have come back into the hobby in the last two and a half years. Yeah, and probably fifty percent have come out in the last eighteen months. So to them, PSA is the end all be all. People don't realize that until about 
three or four years ago, five at the most, BGS was considered superior to PSA. A BGS 9.5 sold for more than a PSA 10 did. Yeah. Like, that is a, that is a, uh, a situation that has shifted in the last few years. It will continue to shift. Things will continue to change. Uh, it's just like NFTs. There's a lot of, you know, poo-pooing about NFTs. The reality of it is, is that NFTs aren't going anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and think about how much money uh, Fortnite makes. Think about... Not in my house. Well, maybe not in your house, but in general, <laughs> I mean... We had to delete that game. Yeah. <laughs> Fortnite makes so much money on their V bucks for people to buy things to dress up their digital character that doesn't even affect the gameplay at all. That and they, they can't sell, sell right? them yeah. or trade them to anyone. NFTs aren't going away. NFTs are going to become bigger and bigger and bigger, not in the short term. If you're buying NFTs to flip them, you better get in at the beginning of something when it launches, like Top Shot did and things like that. But in the long run, they're not going anywhere, and it's not a terrible place to throw dollars because as the generation that grew up on Fortnite becomes adults and has disposable income, yeah. they're already in that mindset. Their brain's already in that world. Yeah. All right, we got to move on. Yeah, we could go We're talking a lot. We're, we're, we're making up for lost time, lost right? episodes. Let's talk about some recent pickups. You don't want to talk about recent well, pickups? Well, you can brag. Go ahead. Well, I mean... I. I mean, I may, I may have hit pretty good. Yeah, a little bit of a run lately. I've been on a heater, guys. Not only did I annihilate Vegas, but in the last several breaks, I've been on a heater that I've gotten into. Your run on Vegas um, toilets doesn't count as annihilating so Vegas. I don't believe we talked about this last time, but if we did, I'm going to say it again. I don't think we did. Uh, one of the things that uh, Gary and I like to do is to get in these rooms where you can play poker for cards. So you do entry free, hop into a poker uh, app, lounge, whatever. Is this legal while I'm talking about it? I don't yeah. know. Okay, cool. Either way, uh, you hop in, you play sure. a game for a card or whatever. In this case, it was to play for a spot in an immaculate uh, football break. So college uni, uh, but uh, immaculate football. Um, you would pay, what was it, eight, ten bucks, something like that. Something cheap, just for yeah. a spot. There's this guy's trying to fill his break. So. Yeah. Um, I do once, you know, I, I get in one game. Gary's also in that game. He goes out quickly, swiftly. Poor uh, betting. I don't even want to talk about it because it was play, BS. No, it was Aggressive like, play. I got two and four like, outer like This five guy times. could not have been an understudy on rounders, I'll tell you that. Wow. Um, he doesn't really like poker that much anyway. So, wow. Um, but anyway, I beat him, and then I go <laughs> on to beat four other people for one spot, and wouldn't you know it, I hit the Jacksonville Jags. Well, and the best part about that story is... On is a random. At the end of the poker game, I get a message from Jason saying, hey, should I take the spot or should I take the buyback? No, I there was just, a different break. I thought there, there was, was a cro- buyback. Too. Oh, no, yeah, it was Chronicles. Chronicles. It was like, can I get... I can it get was like a ton s- of Chronicles. Six spots in Chronicles. But I, I never hit like anything. One spot in this Immaculate break. I never break. hit anything in and Immaculate. And I said, you have to take the Immaculate break for 10 bucks. So I did, and and I hit a immaculate Trevor Lawrence autograph rookie to ninety nine. Yeah, it's a pretty on an eight dollar. Yeah, it's not a bad eight dollar investment. Room. It's a good spot. It's a good spot. It's going up online. I'm gonna sell it. College Uni's got to go. If you're hanging on to College Uni NFL rookie stuff, it better be a long hold because yeah. as these NFL Unis come out, the price will plummet. Yep. So that being said, hit me up if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, most of my pickups lately have been in the form of stuff that I've sent off to get graded that's come back. Um, I I tend to grab raw stuff and try to get it as cheap as I can and then send it off to get graded. And I have gotten back quite a bit of stuff. I finally got back. We were talking about that, Luke. I finally got back my CSG order that sat for months. Um, I was super excited that when I got it back, uh, I should have just been angry, but I wasn't because I'm a child and even though i was angry at them i saw the email that it was being shipped back and i just got all excited 
I try usually when that happens to not look at the grades so that I can open the box and be surprised, but I went ahead and looked at the grades on those, and I saw that Luke attend with them, and I was pretty ecstatic about it. But I've gotten a couple of SGC subs back lately on some really, really low pop, high-end stuff. I got two uh, Kyler Murray slabs that are true pop ones. If you hear somebody use the term true pop one, that means it is the only card graded in that grade across all of the three major grading companies. Uh, I got two Kylers that came back. They're numbered ones to 75, ones to 150. Rookies that are true pop ones. Kyler's a machine. He's looking so yeah, good. Yeah, he's going to be pretty good. Uh, I got a really nice Prism CD Lamb uh, to 199 Blue Wave back that came back at 10. Uh, those have been the my pickups lately. So not only did Trevor Lawrence happen, and now the next products aren't as exciting, but we're looking at like Leaf Trinity Football, um, another Leaf product. This was a, fu- a great, great hobby box if you have young ones getting into it or if you just want to rip a ton of autos. Is this perfect game national showcase baseball? Yeah, if you just want a bunch of high school baseball players. Yep, but prospects. I mean, it's not Yeah, though no, they're not just, just random, nobodies. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's not random. They're, no, they're the top probably 100 players um, in the country. But between that and the Leaf uh, Trinity football, in one week of breaks, and I'm sure there was cheap buy-ins, like, what, 10 bucks a spot yeah. on some of these. I hit three one-of-ones. Yeah, because you had a horseshoe stuck up your ass sideways. Yeah, and apparently that left right before Vegas. <laughs> you left it. Yeah. You left it at the Golden Took Nugget. some magnesium citrate <laughs> right before my right flight, <laughs> and away she went. You know, now that I think about it, I should include these break winnings into my Vegas numbers, and it's starting to look a whole lot better. I mean, you can do that in your own head. Nobody else in reality will do that. But I, I rip on Leaf products a lot of times just because I – Especially with baseball, it's so hard for me to enjoy a product where there's not a uniform on it. It just bugs me. I like licensed products. But as I went through it, I mean, just some of the hits that I've had in the last few days, one of these one-of-ones has a sick patch on it, on-card auto. Leafs patches are they stupid are. nice. They are. What's the other like one I hit? That Jalen Waddle. Uh, uh, the touchdown king. Yeah, the touchdown cracked king, ice. cracked ice to 20. Metal draft, yeah. And as a Dolphins fan, I wasn't mad about that at all. Also hit some of the uh, – speaking of cracked ice, select basketball. Yeah. I think this year's select basketball is looking real nice. It is. I think that one thing people have to remember, though, about select this year is it came out as a retail release for the first time. But unlike Prism, and this is something to really remember – The Retail Select has a completely different color scheme than Hobby Select. Mm -hmm. So if you see a base card or you see a prism, you see a select card that has a blue face and you've collected select before, you're thinking immediately, oh, that's that's a color, that's a prism. Right. Look at the back. The retail base cards are blue. Mm hmm Okay? They're not a prism. Now, you could still have a blue prism, but it came out of Hobby. Yeah. Yep. So uh, that's that's kind of been it. I haven't chased after any players lately. I, I, I probably get back into that with the NFL. I kind of like to see what's happening with rookies or people getting called up. Um, do you want to move into some? Let's let's talk a little bit of baseball real quick. We're already we're already just a good ways into this. Okay, well, so, real quick baseball, and then we'll jump into week one. NFL MVP talk. talk. Forget the NL. Let's. It's all AL. Yeah, the NL is likely going to be Bryce Harper, which makes just about uh, anybody with I like mean, a soul gag. But other than being a Buckeye fan, I don't have much. I just don't know why. Why does he bug me so much? He's just, he feels like that guy. Does that make sense? Does he go to a steakhouse and order like a Corona and ask for two limes? Yeah. Because that's what the vibe I get. Yeah, he's just that guy. He just, that kind of cocky dude. And it's annoying because you know he can back up the cockiness, but he's still super cocky. It's just, he's that guy. Like you beat him in ping pong and he needs to play you like 20 times until he wins once. Yeah, but he would beat you 20 times. Yeah, but I beat you twice to today. You that did. was a setup. It I just wanted to, to bring it up. Yeah. Two to one. You were feeling good about it. Yes. And I told you I was sitting on a bad side of the table. Yeah, the th- and then you moved me to the bad side of the table. And then I crushed you. And, and then, then the third, the third game, game was we, close. we evened the table out. 21-19. Yeah. Which, who had 21? You did. Okay. So, 
Anyway, so Bryce you Harper. You have a ping pong table in your house. I play once every four months. <laughs> Here we go again. I'm just saying. Here we go. Yeah, but you do that stupid grip. Like, if somebody's going to be impressed, like, oh my gosh, an inverted grip on a paddle. I only this do guy that must I, be real I good. I only do that when I serve. That's like kids wearing Reebok pumps, like they're going to dunk Dude, on you I in would 1994. totally wear Reebok pumps right yeah, now. Yeah, but if your I can knees find aren't going to work because you're wearing No, do them. they make, like, knee braces that are like Reebok pumps? No, I they also like don't make size 72 Reebok <laughs> pumps, so you're out of luck twice. <laughs> All right, baseball talk. AL, it's all Otani versus Vlad. The sports books will tell you with the odds that they have out right now that they believe that it is an absolute lock that Otani is going to win the MVP. If he wins the MVP, and I don't say this lightly, and I don't, oh, how do I, I'm going to piss a lot of people off when I say this. Do it. I will not say that it's a, one of the least deserved MVPs ever because that's not true. That's not, I'm I'm saying I won't say that, but if Otani hadn't pitched a hundred or two, 120 innings this year, there wouldn't even be talk about him as the MVP. Vlad Guerrero Jr. Is top three in every single offensive statistical category that exists Mm -hmm. in the AL, in the majors, not just the AL in the majors. He leads the majors in home runs. He leads the majors in batting average. He's third in RBIs. Like, he's first in OPS. Yeah. It's not even close. Otani's hitting 255. Yeah. He's hit some home runs, but he's not leading the league. Yeah. He's pitched 120 innings, whatever it is, but he's not even close to the league leading the ERA. He's not even leading the league in strikeouts per inning. Like, it's cool what he's doing. Don't get me wrong. And if Guerrero wasn't having the year he's having, I think Otani is very deserving MVP. Is Otani still in the conversation if he doesn't pitch? I don't think so. Wow. I think if Otani wasn't pitching, he'd Who's be there? a home run. I think you're looking at, realistically, Salvador Perez and Vlad. Yeah. Those are the two guys you'd be talking about. Yeah. I mean, hell, in a regular year when Vlad isn't doing what he's doing, Salvador Perez would be running away with it. That yeah. dude is smashing. Yeah. So that's baseball talk. NFL, hot, move on. Hot move take. On. Here we go. NFL recap. Week one. Let's talk about them Jags. Everybody's they're, so excited about them Jags. They're bad, boys. They're real bad. It's not good. They they might be historically like Detroit Lions mid-2000s bad. Would you still be starting Trevor Lawrence right now? If I was the Jags? Yeah. They don't have a choice. Yeah. Who are they going to start? Jake Luton? They traded yeah. the quarterback they should have started. I agree with you on that one. Like, they traded him because Urban Meyer knew the fan base was going to start screaming for him after about two quarters. So Trevor Lawrence is just going to get crushed this year. Correct. I think Trevor Lawrence will throw a lot of touchdown passes, but he's going to throw a lot of picks, and he's going to get sacked a lot. You know who Trevor Lawrence reminds me of? This is a hot take. Okay. He reminds me a lot of Ryan Tannehill. Oh, I don't think so. Ryan Tannehill came in. Fanfare hype. No. Yeah. Oh are you yeah. On oh crack? yeah. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. Well, Brian go back played and, one year of college football as a quarterback. As a beast. And mm. he came in, got sacked like sixty times that first season, and it gave him a complex. Well it took him like eight years to shake that. Well, yeah, I, I think that the difference there, I, I think that Trevor Lawrence talent wise is on a whole different planet than Ryan Tannehill. I don't know. Um the issue is that the Jags are not good up front. And it appears that the coaching staff has decided to not even try to help him out with a balanced offense. Like the kid threw the ball 51 or 53 times in his first game. They had like 15 rushing attempts. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they're down. But if you know you're going to lose, why are you trying to get your kid killed? Yeah. I think the other thing that people have to think about with Jacksonville, and as somebody who is an Ohio State fan, as somebody who's been around that program Mm -hmm. some, I'm not going to be shocked at all. As a matter of fact, I'd say it's a coin flip that Urban Meyer is still the coach by the end of the year. End of the year? Oh, yeah. I think about eight or nine games in, we're going to start hearing reports that his brain issues are coming back. Oh, boy. There's a reason that he had to come out and say, oh, I'm not interested in that USC job. I've said before they hired him, and once they hired him, his coaching style and the NFL do not mesh. Yeah. At all. Yeah. You cannot treat grown men who make more money than you like they are 12 years old. Mm-hmm. Doesn't work. This is an aggressive take. I'm just. Yeah, I think they're in trouble. I, I really hope that Trevor Lawrence does not get demoralized 
to the point where he doesn't have confidence. Because you do see that happen. Oh, that yeah. That part I saw with Tannehill. Yeah. For sure. I think what's, what bothered me and worried me more than the, the, the hits that he took were he threw three picks, and two of those picks, Houston's just sitting in zone, and he did not know they were in zone. Yeah. He, he, it was obvious he thought they yeah. were in man coverage. Uh, so one of two things is happening. Either he's forgotten how to read defenses from the end of his time at Clemson to now, or – the coaching that he's getting is not mm -hmm. up to snuff. And mm -hmm. I lean more towards that than I do. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Anything else? It's a strong crew because Anthony Schlegel is their strength. Oh, Schlegel's a good coach. dude. Yeah. He's a good dude. They're but probably I mean, like got monster you, you, energy you drinks. Think you think they're lifting Trevor, though? Oh, I creatine. Don't. <laughs> I'm trying to think of other like time period. So Jag's bad. The other takeaway from that game, though, and I heard a couple of people getting real excited because they were Texans fans. Guess who else is really bad, guys? The Texans. They're really bad. Yeah. They just played a worse team. Texans might win three games this year. They're bad. It's a bad football so team. So the next note I see here, which I did not write down, is Dolphins, meh, question meh. mark. Meh. I think I was very clear a couple episodes ago that we will be in above 500 season. We will make a wild card play, and it'll probably end there. Yeah, still meh. Look at the program five years ago. So here's what you got going for you. If you make fun of Tua one more time. You've got a stout defense. You've got one of the two or three best corners in the NFL. Great coach. You've got a defensive line that is super underrated. Brian Flores is a great coach. You drafted a receiver in the first round who appears to be the real deal, yep. and they're utilizing him properly out of the slot You're mostly. setting all this up to break my heart. Um, Don't do it. You've got a running back crew that is better than you would think they are. Miles Gaskin is better than you think he is. Yeah. He's not great, but he's better than everybody thinks he is. Your quarterback is eh. And he just is. Like I, So I don't think Tua is a stud. Uh, I don't think last year is going to be Andy an Dalton. accurate depiction of. Uh, man, he's early career Andy Dalton, man. If you give him a great running game and good play action, he's going to be he's going to be a top fifteen think, guy. Yeah, and if I you don't give be, him that, yeah. he's a bottom ten guy. Yeah, well, I'm really nervous about accuracy with him. Yeah, he's he's that's concerning to me. Um, but I think that we got to give this one a little bit of time. Uh, a two and zero start. Um, especially if you could, happen. I think the Dolphins get past the Bills this week. Yeah. Down in Miami, it's going to be a million degrees. I don't think the Bills lay two eggs in a row. There's too much talent on that team. Yeah. Well, we'll see about that. And um, if it does happen, that's a great start for them in the division. I you know, disagree. they're sitting in a good spot. Yep. Um, it's going to be really tough to beat the Bills twice. I do know that. I think that two is accuracy issues combined with Buffalo's defense is going to be issues for you guys. Yeah, I hope we run really well. Um, okay. Aaron Rodgers. Let's just talk the whole Green Bay situation, oh. which my fantasy team is in trouble right now. <laughs> my fantasy team is in trouble. You know, the monster that is the commissioner of the league that I'm in decided that uh, my wife's birthday was not a reason to move the draft to another night with all of the <laughs> other guys that had already agreed to that time. So anyway, um, I had, you know, like a list of who I wanted, like position wise, ranking, all that. And I ended up pretty Green Bay heavy here. So I'm a little bit nervous. I think it's OK to be nervous about it. Um, I'm playing you this week. Yeah, Green Bay is not as bad as they looked against New Orleans, but I don't think they're anywhere near as good as they were last year. Aaron I mean, Rodgers is not washed up, but he did have the third worst game of his career against New Orleans and there were times that he was visibly frustrated and the last interception that he threw is a pass that at no other point in his career would have even tried. He is not a chuck and duck guy and that was a chuck and duck. Yeah, uh Aaron Jones, do you know how many points he had? Do you remember? No, because they barely had the ball. Yeah. Uh 3.2. Yeah, they, they didn't run the ball hardly at all. They yeah. barely had the ball and they're playing from way mm -hmm. behind me. Jameis Winston had five touchdowns in that game. But you got Devontae Adams. He's a beast, right? The whole offense was horrible. Yeah, uh, eight points. Yeah. So the Green Bay situation, I don't think the drama is going to stop anytime soon. I think Aaron Rodgers has disappointed me a little bit. Not that he cares at all. <laughs> but, like, I just didn't know that he was so – had such a flair for the dramatic. And that's what – you know, when you hear the you stories – paying attention for the yeah, last Yeah, apparently, years. apparently. But 
um, to see, you know, some of the rumors. They're talking about how, you know, this and that. And you just always think, no, no. Everybody's hyping up the story, propping up a story for the drama. And then you just kind of watch and you even see the interviews and you begin to wonder, like, is he already completely checked out? Or was he just checked out this summer so they just have no, like, rhythm right now? But Green Bay is an issue. Yeah, I think they I think they're going to not be anywhere near as good as they were last year. I still think they win nine or ten games, um, probably sneak into the playoffs yeah. and then see what happens. I think everybody – the problem they've got is everybody in the building knows that this is Aaron Rodgers' last year there. And I don't care who you are. I don't care how mentally strong you are. Think about any job you've ever had, and you know you're on your way out the door. How easy is it to be at your best? I'm going to give it everything I've got. <laughs> That's my point. Uh, so I think there's there are definitely issues in Green Bay. Uh, I don't think it's an overreaction time. If you're if you were trying to flip Aaron Rodgers' cards, you were doing it wrong anyway. He's a first ballot Hall of Famer. Wait for them to be like one and five, and then buy up because they'll yeah, be a dip again. Stuff yeah. will drop. Uh, but he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. Uh, whatever. What do we got next? Uh, this kid named Mac Jones. Mac Jones looked real, man. I I know that this is, you know, week one and it's overreaction time. And I say this understanding that you guys are listening and you're going to hear one thing and it's not what I'm saying. You're going to hear what I say and you're going to say, oh, just he just said he's as good as Tom say. Brady. He rem- The way he plays the game in that offense looks just like early career Tom Brady. Mm-hmm. He takes what the defense gives him. He's accurate as all get out. Like, he doesn't miss spots. He doesn't force the ball anywhere. He takes his read and he takes his check downs. He doesn't go after anything he doesn't have to go after. But when it's third and seven, he will throw the ball at least eight yards in the air. Yeah. Which you can't say for a lot of young quarterbacks. True. Including one of the ones we talked about earlier. (laughs) Yeah, Um, that's true. So I think he he looks legit, and the thing that's the most encouraging about him is the fact that one of the keys to playing quarterback at any level is being willing to take what defenses give you and not get greedy. And he shows no inclination of being greedy at all. And the other thing that was really, really encouraging watching him play, uh, if you're a Pats fan, is the fact that he knows what he's looking at. He checked in and out of things several times that were like some next level pre-snap reads that got the Patriots in good position. Like he he did everything in that game that he could for them to win. The Patriots defense didn't. Yeah. Um, so Mac Jones, high, high upside, I think. Last guy we'll talk about in the rookie quarterbacks, Zach Wilson. Tale of two halves, boys. First half, that dude looked like he was lost. I think it was two of 11 in the first half. It was ugly. And he went in at halftime and drank a monster or did whatever and came back out in the second half and looked like an entirely different player. I've never seen a game where the game appeared to slow down that Mm -hmm. quickly just in a 15-minute halftime break. I think he ended up with like 270 yards and two touchdowns. Corey Davis looked good. Mm -hmm. I said a few weeks ago that Corey Davis was a guy you should be – jumping after because he's the only guy in the preseason he was getting targets like crazy uh so zach wilson also high upside guy um all the one rookie quarterback that started that looked pretty bad was trevor lawrence the other two didn't look awful uh zach wilson did for a half mac jones looked good for the whole game one other guy i'll talk about not on the list and then we'll let jason close us out here as a Bengals fan and as a Bengals homer Jamar Chase remembered how to catch the football, folks. <laughs> Everybody was throwing their hands up in the air because he had a quote taken out of context. Jamar Chase looked legit, and so did Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow did not look tentative. He was comfortable in the pocket. And as a Bengals fan, I watched that game and thought to myself, my Bengals are going to figure out how to bangle this. They're going to choke it away, and they didn't. They took everything that Minnesota threw at them. They took it in stride, went into overtime, and went and won that football game. Uh, and it was impressive to watch. So in closing, I just want to point out that the ESPN Fantasy app projections, win probability, (laughs) which are always very accurate, have my Sunday meat sweats winning, beating you 112.9 to 103.9. We'll see. Do I have have what it takes to beat your 
I mean, your projections are based on my lineup Team. from last week. I haven't even gone in and done it. Oh, I haven't yet. touched mine either. Okay. I'm afraid to say the name of your team. I don't know what the rules are. Yeah, I wouldn't. I would just leave that alone. <laughs> Circleville, Big Harry, and then there's another word after that. Yeah. I'm going to beat you. You can try. So there's that. I, I, I named my team what it did, so it would sound super weird if you actually said that you were going to beat me. Mine are the Sunday meat sweats, and my picture is a bowl of chili because <laughs> that's what I think of when I think about watching <laughs> football on a Sunday <laughs> is eating way too much chili and then taking naps throughout uh, the game. See, for me, it used to be a, it used to be because I'm not super fat anymore. I used to go <laughs> – I'm just a little bit fat. I used to, on the way home to watch football, I would grab a Crave case of White Castle cheeseburgers. Oh, my gosh. And three two liters of Mountain Dew, and I didn't move from my chair for nine hours. I tell you what, I'd be moving from one chair to a different one. <laughs> <laughs> if I had that. All right. That, that, was, note. that was a very lengthy episode, but we had some catching up to do. Thanks so much for joining us on episode 10 of the Ball Card Show.